And today I'm going to talk about our use case where we are build a new testing infrastructure using Mesos. And it has helped us efficiently re use our resources as well as save a lot of uh, money uh, as company-wide. So let me jump on to the slides. Um, PayPal's and its code is growing year after year. In 2010, we had around 560 services. And in 2014, we had 121 services. And we are expecting to grow up to 2,000 services in 2018. And as we grow, you see the number of transactions grows every year. Number of users have been growing. And uh, similarly, uh, the developer community and quality engineers have also uh, increased over a number of years. And the major challenge that we are facing today is how do we, how do we test uh, all our code before releasing? Um, uh, thousand plus services on a, and how, how we um, maintain our test infrastructure, um, and how can we actually improve it? So let me talk about how the test cycle looks like today. Um, for every team, um, we provision a VM, and that could take some time. Uh, the infrastructure provides uh, them a, a, a VM. And then uh, the people or the person who is using it, he deploys the code on it. And along with his own code, the developer also uh, deploys all the dependent services onto the single VM, which could be 1,000 plus. This is, OK, sorry, my slides are skipping. Um, and once he has deployed all the dependent services, then he starts them up, he brings them up, and then he keeps, um, he tries to um, bring up all the services up and run his tests. And when he's running the test, then he figures out, oh, there are certain services which are still down. So I need to, I need to start them as well. So then he starts uh, debugging and try to bring the, all the dependent services up and running. And um, the whole process could take several hours. Um, to a minimum, it would take four to five hours. And then every team have a complicated way of testing the scenarios. Uh, there could be some third party integrations, uh, which needs a special setup. Or there could be um, some other use cases which other teams do not encounter. So they start maintaining their own kind of a wiki or a document to see how, do they, how they can do this more efficiently. And any new team member can pick it up easily. And it's a pain to actually maintain this. So let's look at what are the main pain points. One is deploying all the codes all, all the time on all the VMs which is not a very efficient way of doing things. Secondly, it takes a lot of time to set up and then test and to release this code uh, on live, because you're most of the time you're trying to set it up. And then identifying transitive dependencies. Like in a service-oriented architecture, you're only concerned about what service you talk to. And you should not be caring about what that service talks to the next. And over here, uh, you are always trying to uh, see what are the transitive dependencies and how do, how do that actually affect your environment and bring them up all the time. And then maintaining a stable environment. Suppose you, are, you have deployed everything, everything looks good, but uh, say over a period of time, you're running long running services and you're trying to run somebody else's code and the environment becomes unstable after some time. So you're trying to now debug what's the issue, how do I fix it, and that's not even your code. From the infrastructure point of view, um, the hardware requirements keeps going every day, every year. Um, so say in the 2010, if the person required only um, eight CPUs, um, six, uh, 24 or say 64 GB RAM, and now he requires 16 CPUs and 128 GB RAM. And that's where our hardware cost keeps going every day, every year. And also, we are trying to maintain uh, all the small test environments that people have on their single VM, which requires a lot of people to support it and kind of debug the, their issues if they run into issues. And then definitely when we are trying to download all the packages on all the VM, you are trying to, in, the network bandwidth will also get affected. And um, so we have to kind of constantly keep a check on what's, uh, how much network bandwidth do we need. 
And the test topology is also not the same because uh, in production, um, all our codes, all the services are de uh, deployed on our pools, and they talk to other services through, through a different topology, whereas in a, in a single VM, you are trying to locate services on a single, on the local host. Whereas um, there are some built-in assumptions of our testing infrastructure that if service A is talking to service B, it will try to look at a particular path on the local host and have some tooling around it, which has to kind of change if we change the model of moving away from a single VM. So what are the requirements for, for the new infrastructure that we want to build? So we want something like a production-like environment. We, where all the services are running all the time, and at least one, or at least two or more instances of each service is running, so that it's highly available. Um, it needs to scale up to the number of requests coming in. So if we have 500 or 5,000 developers, uh, all developers are going to hit this environment. So it needs to scale up to that. It, it needs to scale to uh, entertain all those requests. And then, um, if it's a production-like environment, the code needs to be refreshed um, every day uh, to keep it uh, exactly as the live-like versions. And the, the refresh cycle should not take that much. Uh, it should not take that much time. So the code refresh needs to happen uh, in minutes. And then, uh, suppose we build this environment. And now we are trying to uh, connect all, all the other small VMs to this environment. Uh, it should not take. It should be very easy to configure, and point all these smaller VMs to this environment. So, looking at these requirements, what do we need? Um, and uh, so, first, first of all, we definitely needed a resource manager, where where we could actually give all our hardware to this resource manager, and it would manage it for us. Um, so we have a large set of machines, and we needed a resource manager which could manage it in terms of computes, like CPUs, RAMs, and disk. And then we wanted to move away from static allocation of machines. And that's how it is done in production, but uh, we, don't, we don't want to have a lot of teams or people to support it um, and kind of uh, keep monitoring it. So we wanted to move away from static allocation of machines to like dynamically allocate machines based on which machine suits best for what kind of task. And then we were running, um, already running into issues like we had a large capacity in our data center uh, for the development work, but we were running hot on certain, certain capacity of our data centers, which were running very high on load. Uh, say 30 to 40% were running really high on load, and the rest of the 60% was uh, lying idle. And uh, we wanted to move to a model where we could efficiently use all the resources in our data center and, uh, and kind of uh, also categorize all these uh, resources in, such a, in a certain way uh, to kind of serve all our diverse PayPal stack. Uh, as, we, as some of you might, not, might know, that PayPal kind of supports Node, Kraken, uh, Node.js, um, Java, um, C++, and Python, and uh, various other frameworks. So it needs to kind of entertain all those slaves in, maybe in a different fashion. So we chose Mesos as our resource manager to kind of manage all our resources. And once we have Mesos handling all the resources, we definitely needed something to run on top of Mesos, like a framework or a job scheduler, which could uh, kind of, which we could use to spin off jobs on on the resources. So the requirements that we had for our job scheduler is that it could run the jobs in particular order, and then it could bind these jobs to particular particular kind of slaves based on certain constraints, and uh, which we have defined as attributes uh, while spinning off the Mesos slaves. And definitely, we needed something like an auto-healing, because nobody would actually manually sit behind those slaves and keep, on, keep monitoring all the time. So even if, this, even if the job, or if, even if the slave gets lost, or the connectivity gets lost, you would like the job scheduler to spin off another VM or kind of find another slave to run the same job. 
And in this way, you are trying to see that it is always uh, automatically auto-healing itself. And then if we have some kind of a REST API capability, that would be nice to build our tools around it. And then um, also, if something like a final task could be given to it, which could clean up the slave once the job is done, so that it's completely free of any footprint, uh, footprint uh, left behind of the previous job running, and uh, so that the new job would find it exactly as new. So we kind of uh, chose Aurora Scheduler, uh, Apache Aurora as our scheduler. And um, when we were running it last year, we were running with the version 0.5.0, which was not having the REST API capability. But I, I think uh, once we upgraded to 0.5.1, it started giving us the REST APIs, which worked out pretty well for us. So uh, what is a managed stage? Um, a managed stage is, is the environment that we build. It's, like, it's a multi-node staging environment. Uh, it's built on top of Mesos. And this environment gives the infrastructure for the developers and quality engineers to test against, and their apps can be released to live much quickly, and it can in increase their productivity leap forth. And it's called managed stages because it's kind of managed by uh, it's kind of managed by our team because we we kind of build this infrastructure and then we actually deploy the codes on it every day and kind of manage it for them, and the people who are using it can just get away from of dealing with all the stage issues or VM issues that they had before. So I'm going to jump onto the architecture of this. So as you can see, we have a highly available Mesos master and uh, Aurora scheduler. And they are talking to the zookeeper to elect the leader. And then we have a main entry point, which is our F5, uh, which is a hardware load balancer. And then behind the F5 sits are all the machines where we spin off jobs uh, using the Aurora scheduler and kind of uh, create the, this kind of a pool, which is similar to like production. Uh, for simplicity, I've just kept only four pools, uh, pool front, pool mid, pool back. But in actual uh, production, our code has around uh, 100, 100 plus pools. So, Every call that goes to the F5, our main entry point, reaches the router pool, and router pool kind of defines where the call needs to go next. And all of these machines connect to the same database behind the scene. Um, I'll come to how we are using, how we're doing the service uh, discovery uh, a little later, and how we are doing the service registration as well. So um, this is one of our sample Aurora tasks. I hope you can read this. So, so we have like four tasks over here, set up, install, actually four processes. Set up, install, start, and monitor. And then we have defined the constraints like uh, first set up, then install, then start, and monitor. So this is the order of execution of the job. And, uh, and that's how Aurora uh, uses it. It's like a pistachio template. Um, for some of you I've talked over here, it seems a little difficult to like understand the whole uh, Aurora pistachio template and then write it on top of it, write tooling around it. But once you do that, I think it's pretty easy to use. And here's one of the scenario where we have a little complex job scenario, but it's not that complex. Um, above in the, in the black screenshot, you have three different orders. Uh, the first order is completely independent of the second order, which is completely independent of the third order. And they all run parallelly. And um, one slave is uh, running all these jobs um, in parallel. And as you can see, um, the last job that you see is the start Columbus. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a kind of a Java application that we are starting up. And we define it as a daemon. So even if the application has an issue or for some reason it, it goes down, since we defined it as a daemon, it keeps on running. And uh, that's why the, the run shows as four. And um, so that means it had, it had died three times. And, but still, uh, we, don't, we didn't have to do any manual intervention. And it uh, restarted the application itself. So the, coming to the dynamic uh, discovery and registration part, um, I think this is skipping on its own. But let me go through the diagram myself. Um, so, well, okay. 
There you go. Uh, so we spin off a job from the Aurora scheduler, and the job goes and resides on one of the machines. And for in this example, it goes and ty types into the pool front. And once the pool front the job reaches the monitor state, that means the services is up and running. And once the service is up and running, it goes and writes the data into the zookeeper. And once the service has registered itself to the zookeeper, uh, a router pool is running an application called Columbus and keeps a watch on the zookeeper data. And uh, every time a new service comes into the zookeeper, it, it, re, it kind of gets the event, and it re, rewrites the HA proxy configuration. And that's how you know, it knows that any call coming from the main entry point reaching the router pool, where the service is running, and how does it have to point to. Now, we got the inspiration of writing this uh, from the open source Airbnb code, which was called Synapse and Nerve. Uh, but uh, later on, because of our PayPal code, uh, PayPal code stack, we had our requirements to have URL-based routing as well. So even if the person is hitting, say, www.paypal.com slash particular URL, you want to route the traffic based on that URL, which required um, SSL termination for HTTP, HTTP calls. And that's where we actually write, wrote our own um, HA proxy configurations, because the Synapse and Nerve was only dealing with the TCP protocols, and we wanted an HTTP uh, handling as well in our service routing. And it, it works pretty well for us. So how does the code deployment cycle looks like? So we have around 5,000 RPMs, and the whole deployment over a span of 200 VMs takes less than one hour, which is huge. Like, when, when you used to do deployments on one VM, it, takes, it used to take more than three hours to four hours to deploy. And now we are deploying more packages than deployed on one single VM over distributed, and it takes less than one hour. And that's too when it's a full deploy, that the VM is completely clean and we are deploying from, a scra from scratch. For an incremental deploy, it takes less than 20 minutes. And it, that depends on how much packages have changed per day. If the packages changes are very few, it could just finish up in less than five minutes. And then we have two types of deployment types. One is in place and one is full deploy. In place, as it says that uh, if a pool has four instances running, we would take one instance out, incrementally deploy the changed packages, and then put it back in traffic. And then that's how we're going to do it for the rest of the three as well. But in full deploy, if we have four instances, we take down half the capacity out and deploy the latest code, completely point to a different web. And uh, we switch to the latest code. And once we do the switch, then we scale up the rest of the remaining half of the capacity, which was still running on the old code. And we merge it to the latest code. And to maintain the code um, as close as the live code, we do daily, co daily code refresh incrementally and uh, biweekly code refresh, a uh, full code refresh. So let's look at how dependent stage would look like or dependent VM would look like before and after. So suppose a, a developer is developing a service called Foo with N plus one version, and uh, it needs to integrate with 1,000 plus services. That's how, it, how, that's how his VM would look like earlier. Uh, 1,000 plus services are deployed along with the, his own service. And then, now coming with the managed stage and pitcher, these 1,000 plus services are already running in the managed stages. So he does not even require this big of a hardware to run his own service, which will shrink to a very small size. And then we use HA proxy to point all all the service dependencies to the managed stage. So you see the, the, the size of the VM has grown very small. The deployment time has improved a lot. Uh, the, the developer is really happy that he does not have to do much on his own VM and not debug anything. And kind of, uh, he's ready to test in less than, say, five minutes. This also brings us the challenge of Maintaining the managed stage, it needs to be highly available and reliable. 
Uh, if everybody is using it, we need, to, we need to have good monitoring around it, that all the services are up and running. And um, it needs to be reliable, and it needs to be also having some SLAs of the service should return responses in right time. So now how the test cycle looks like at PayPal is you have you provision a VM, uh, which we can now provision in a very small VM for him, which would not take lo that long time. Now he, he, he develops the code, he just deploys it on the VM, and then he tests. And it has, it's a huge advantage for the developer now. Uh, they don't have to spend a lot of time setting up their own environment. So coming to the advantages, as I have already spoken, developers' state setup time has reduced by 90%. And the productivity has improved by 30 to 40 percent, and he does not have to maintain any transitive dependencies because it's all taken care of uh, inside the managed stages, um, and he can just use it as is. From the infrastructure point of view, uh, we have a much more optimized resource utilization, uh, much reduced hardware costs in our data centers because we are always reclaiming. Uh, back bigger VMs and provisioning smaller VMs to the developer, and also less network traffic because not everybody is pulling all the packages onto their own VM. And for our release cycles, we have actually uh, we have three versions of managed stages running right now. One is managed stages. Uh, one is the for the live version. One is for the N plus one version, which people have already approved that it's going to go, go on live. And one is for the LNP testing. And um, so people have, or the developer has the capability of pointing his own VM to the live code or the N plus one code. So coming to um, why Mesos, or what was our motivation behind choosing Mesos, uh, well, it's pretty simple. We, when we started this project last year, we were already having a success story in-house. Um, some of you might have attended the Jenkins or CI um, on Mesos talk, which my colleague gave yesterday. Um, it, it's running on Mesos, uh, and it's, it's a huge success. Uh, we are already seeing benefits of it, and it was no-brainer for us to like, move to a model like that. Uh, when we did our POC, we, we, could, we could finish our um, POC. I mean, the time to set up was really low. Uh, our POC was done in less than one month, and we were ready with this whole infrastructure. When our, once, we had, once we had our whole hardware to run, run this thing, uh, the whole setup took us, like uh, I would say, less than, less than a month to bring it up and running, connect all the pieces, debug everything, and like get it out for the developers to use. And we are constantly uh, building on top of it, uh, the tooling around it. And then somehow Mesos and Aurora just worked for us like out of the box. Uh, we didn't have to worry much about our resources. Uh, the slaves are pretty stable. Uh, the Aurora APIs are pretty nice. Uh, we have already built our scripts around them, uh, the deploy scripts. And they, are, they work perfectly fine. And one thing which we really wanted to move forward is like if we could run our PayPal code um, in, in kind of a Docker container, um, we would need something, something like uh, Mesos uh, Resource Manager where we could spin off our Docker containers uh, based on the sizes or based on how big is the Docker container is going to be. So yeah, it was, a, it was a wise decision, and we are definitely seeing the fruits of it. And uh, to come to that, let's see how much, uh, how much do we save out of that. So let's take for an example, we have approximately 5,000 VM um, allocated to the developers and quality engineers. And then every VM is around 16 CPUs, 64 GB RAM, and 256 GB hard disk. So let's, for the simplicity, only take the compute, which would be uh, 80,000 cores. And then look at managed stages. The total consumption on managed stages is only 1,500 scores. And uh, we're still building it. We are still bringing, up, bringing it up uh, to full capacity. But right now, it's only running with 1,500 cores. So 
what if, if we slice down each and every VM by just half? Although we might want to slice them by 75%, but for simplicity, we're just cutting down by half. By just 50% reduction on each VM, we are saving around 40,000 cores, which is huge. This is, this is, the, the scale of this is so huge that uh, we are not actually allocating any budget for any new hardware uh, for 2015. And we, we're going to sustain uh, with our existing hardware. And that, that hardware should be enough for, for next year, uh, 2015 and 2016. So we are not, at any, we are not uh, allocating any budget for extra hardware to be given to the developers. We're going to be reusing, reshuffling the hardware in, in more efficient use of it. And that's the scale of, uh, that's the scale, or that's the benefit that we're getting out of moving to this kind of an infrastructure. So what's next? Um, as I said that we are running each and every um, VM as its own slave. And there's reason to do that, because every, every VM will, will kind of have a collection of services. Um, but if we can actually do a network isolation on top of it, either by Docker container or or by using the network isolation, which Mesos have just launched on in the version 0.22, uh, we would definitely want to go ahead with that. And that's something which is coming up next. And then uh, right now, uh, the number of instances is kind of uh, configurable from our scripts and database. But uh, what we are developing is developing tooling around it so that it can auto scale. And we can spin off um, more number of instances on particular time of the day based on the usage pattern. And uh, yeah, for, for Mesos, um, we are running two different clusters as of now to run managed stages and also CI. Uh, what we want in future is to merge all our hardware into a single Mesos cluster and then you know maybe use uh, attributes or different racks or different uh, uh, categorization of those slaves to differentiate between what jobs can run where. And somehow we will have one holistic picture of all the hardware that we have. And that's something which we want to do uh, ahead. But that also brings us challenges of um, defining the access control, uh, defining the quotas of which framework can use how much resources, and so on. So for now, we want to keep them as separate. but. And Docker containerization is something which we all want to look like, uh, look forward to in the future. So, what is the vision for us um, going forward? Is we want to build an infrastructure and give it to the developer so that he doesn't have to care about uh, where he is getting this infrastructure from. So it's like on a click of a button, he can create his own environment with whatever version of applications he want. And what all he needs is something reliable to work on. And then he could just give it away onto the cloud. And uh, somebody else might use it. So that's, that's the goal, end goal that we want to. And it should be done in like a um, few minutes or less than a minute, I would say. That's, that's kind of the goal that we are aiming for. Um, but that, I am um, with, done with my slides. Uh, if, I'm happy to answer any questions. Yeah. So my question is regarding the VM part. Are you saying that you will move completely to bare metal deployment with containerizing? Right. Exactly. So what we do is, for now, we are actually running Mesos slaves on, on a VM. And we kind of use the whole VM because of our PayPal uh, code coding or the code stack. Um, but if we are actually able to uh, run the whole PayPal code or a bunch of services into, into like a container, then we don't need to uh, slice the whole bare metal into VMs. And we can just give the whole VM as is. And uh, the Docker container will have the dependent dependencies like uh, the Red Hat uh, code running inside it. Or, uh, and then it can, uh, we can just use the resources even more efficiently than what we are doing today. Yeah. In the case where you've got a developer testing their service, 
right. And then you have many other services that are part of that shared pool. Yeah. How do you manage persistent data, assuming there's some shared data need between the service under test mm -hmm. pool of dependent services? So we are kind of moving people onto the managed stages in phases. But one thing what we do is when, when a dependent VM is connected to this managed stage, uh, they, they the database is automatically pointed to the same database as managed stage. And then we have some access control around it. So they can actually they can run their test cases, create users over there. But uh, if they want to change the whole database schema, they would like a local copy of the database, which is still work in progress. Uh, we don't have a support that person who is connected to managed stage has its own database as well, where we are coming to in the uh, coming few months. So we are still designing the solution for them. But this is for a very simple scenario where it's like a front-end application. It doesn't care about the database. It's talking to other services, one directional flow, and everything works fine. So as of now, uh, for the last couple of months, we have been focusing on getting the whole infrastructure ready and running the whole PayPal code base and kind of maintaining it, monitoring it, and so that people can use it. It's going to be very stable. Uh, but coming to the container part, we still have to kind of explore. And once we, have, we are done with the kind of a proof of concept on how would it exactly run, what, what will be our pool size, how many services are going to run in each container, and so on. Uh, then we're going to kind of decide what's the way uh, we're going to take on containerizing it. But I think it's too soon for us to kind of decide the migration strategy. Yeah. All right. All right. If you don't have any other questions, um, thank you very much. And I hope you enjoy the rest of the day. Thanks.